today is to start you thinking about your article in the sense of you've done some research, perhaps, you're now getting towards wanting to write it, which you'll do in a, couple, in a week or so's time. And the question then is, how do we actually structure a typical article, a typical academic assignment, so that you communicate clearly exactly what it is you want to tell me or your reader, whether it's me or Amanda or any of your other lecturers. So, how do we go about it? The objectives, therefore, are first developing a good structure, then think about, so that's general to everything, <coughs> but then you start having to think about, okay, what is the question? How do you work out what the question is really about? Because we may pose the question in a way that will force you to start thinking much more clearly about what the question really means. You have to dig down a little bit to find out what it's about. And all of you, with your assignment for this module, for the, one, the article you're writing, you've got a really big, big set of questions. Four big questions with a couple of alternatives identified, but there are many, many more. And even within those um, eight <coughs> subsections, there are, there's scope for many, many dozens of different articles with different approaches, different ideas, ways to look at each of those four big topics. And so you want to start thinking about analyzing the question so that you can answer it really, really well. And the third thing we want to look at is how do you write in a way that is incredibly convincing? It carries a stamp of authority. And that comes from knowing your subject before you actually start writing. Going through that red sort of butterfly uh, flight, reading and reading and reading and reading, wherever your references in those articles take you, and building up a good understanding. So those are the three things I want to cover today. first thing you have to think about is in setting the context, because this is what is important as you start writing. What is going the question and what title is going to help the reader to understand exactly what you're going to be writing about? So you have to think about how do I signpost to the reader what my topic is? And the title is the first really, really important thing that you have to do. Because that then provides kind of a framework on which you build all the rest. The structure, the evidence, your analysis, ultimately your conclusions. They, they should all link back to the title. So that's why I said, what is the title that you are going to be using? That's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow in the workshop with all of you. I'll come around and we'll try to hone in on a title, or at least a topic area that leads to a good title, with each one of you in those few minutes I have with each of you in the workshop. That's why the workshop is absolutely critical for the next couple of three weeks. So that you can get as much advice from me that's going to help you to write a really great article that convinces your reader a, about the interesting aspect that you're bringing out, and B, that you've read widely, that you understand the ins and the outs of that particular subject, and then you put it down in a way that really provides evidence and confidence that you understand and you have written in a very, very compulsive way. That I can't stop reading it. I want to get through to the end. I'm not thinking, I'm getting really bored. Because if you write something that ends up, I'm really bored, you're not communicating effectively. <coughs> you won't get people reading your assignments and giving you good marks. You won't, in the future, when you go out for your job interviews, be communicating in a way that grabs the attention of the interviewees and says, I really must employ that guy or that girl. They are people who I can rely on 
who understand the topic and then do something really great with it and communicate to me and my team and convince us that, they, that the analysis is correct and leads in the right sort of direction. So, we've got to think about structure and we've got to think about that title. Now, what I want you to do, amongst all the other, many other things you've got to do, is to think about where can I find guidance about writing an article, writing an assignment. Now, the first place to go, obviously, is going to go to the skills area in the library uh, website where you found Plato and look for writing an assignment. And they will give you three, there are three links there that will help you to get a bit of an idea. Two of the links are really more related to a couple of three years from now with your dissertation. But there is one link that actually connects to some interesting advice out there on a website in the university that helps you to start thinking about an ordinary sort of academic article. Don't stop there. Follow up with other searching in your chosen search engine, Bing, or Google, or Yahoo, or whichever is your chosen internet search engine, and start looking for advice on writing and structuring academic work, assignments, and so on. There's lots and lots there, and the more of those you get and compare and contrast to find out what the really important aspects are, the things that turn up in every single piece of advice, those are going to be the important <laughs> ones. So, go and look there. The next source of advice you get, whether it's from the article specification for this module, or for many of the other assignments you're going to get, some of them will give you advice very clearly on the sort of structure that's required. Whatever the guidance is, for the, the main sections, there will always be a section called an introduction, or maybe context. There will be a section that pulls together all of the analysis from the middle section, and then there will always be a bibliography containing a list of those sources that you have explicitly cited in your writing. So you have three sections which are always, always going to be there. And then you have to think about laying out the structure <coughs> of this middle section, that where it says main sections. Now the introduction is likely to give, be used to set a context. So you'll look at the assignment spec and carefully use little bits from there to help you build that context that introduces your reader to what you are trying to do, the topic area that you're going to be writing about. The way that human brains work is they like, we like to have a little bit of introduction to help us understand what the article or the book is all about. And you've got to write that introduction in a way that makes it really easy for your reader to connect with what you are going to do. So, basic structure plus some specialist structure. Topic specific, assignment specific. Introduction, something, conclusions, and bibliography. So, in thinking a bit further about the question, first of all, <coughs> go back to the assignment specification. And then think very carefully, what are all the clues in the assignment specification that help you to understand the question that has to be answered? Now, the reason that's important is that over the years, we, as academics, we all find students who end up writing a spectacularly brilliant piece of work. You know, in isolation, in terms of the academic criteria, understanding, critical analysis, application, and so on, it's a 95 percenter. So we're reading through and think, wow, this is brilliant. I can't stop turning the pages. It's really good. It's phenomenal 
level of understanding. There's a huge range of different sources to compare and contrast different ideas and concepts. There's some incredible piece of work in terms of the synthesis coming up with this new brilliant idea. We get to the end and think, art. That's a pity. It doesn't even begin to answer the question. At which point we then have a, a, big, a big problem on our hands. A stunning piece of academic work in isolation, but it doesn't <laughs> answer the question. At which point, what was 95% suddenly dropped very, very dramatically to probably about 40%. And that's kind of, for you, a problem. If you haven't understood what the question is, then you've thrown away, potentially, very large amounts of marks. So, make sure that you understand very clearly what the question is that's been set, and use that to work out very clearly and very carefully what you're going to research and what you're going to write about. Then, if you look at the report specification, it will probably give you some guidelines as to how to structure that topic, your main sections. If there is guidance, then you need to make sure that as you plot out or plan out that golden line, here be the question, here be the conclusions, here are the steps, probably if there is guidance, then you need to think about using the guidance to give you the main sections through that, that um, planning. And then you can start building the subsections and so on. So in terms of this current assignment, what you need to think about is do some research to get get a handle on which of those four big subject areas, and then whether you answer one of the two subsidiary ones that I've identified, or that you've got a really cool idea that's related to the main topic, or maybe brings two of those topics together. So you've got that to then lead you into that <coughs> butterfly dance of research and research and research. Building, as I've reminded you before, your working bibliography, the list of all of those sources which you have found in your research. Remembering to properly format all of those references in Harvard Standard. So that you don't waste time in week eight having a hurried activity to go to the URLs and try and work out what the proper <laughs> reference is. Do it beforehand. So you just copy that reference from your working <coughs> bibliography into your article, because you won't have much time to go and try and find the source again and build your reference. Do it now. And if possible, get copies of all of your sources as well. Really, really important, I reminded you last week in the workshop. So as you collect all of these sources and your working bibliography, you should also be making some notes about what the critical message, critical idea or ideas in each of your sources. Because the very act of actually writing a little summary, a set of notes about each of your sources, is that it puts it into your long-term memory. <coughs> If you just read it quickly, it comes and it goes. And what you need to do is to build a complete model in your head, in your mind, about all of this research. Because <coughs> you've got to write about 12 to 1500 words roughly in those three pages. If you have the structure there, and you've got some good notes which, yeah, they're still there on your piece of paper or they're there in your Word documents. Most of those ideas will now be in your head. And that means you can actually start writing that article quite late on in the process. 
And these are all the words that will basically flow off your fingertips. As an example, I think I mentioned last week I went to a conference up in York on the impact of big data on software testing. And I'd also been asked to write a short 1500 word article that will go into the magazine that, that the organiser of that conference publishes on a monthly basis. Because all of that material was in here, other than a couple of items I needed to check up with a little bit of research, I could write the fit required 15, 1600 words without referring to notes or anything. I could type it straight off in a couple of three hours because I have done all of the research, I know all about that little topic area, and can put it together in a way that I can write very quickly. And that's what you need to be thinking about over the next few years to develop that skill, that background knowledge of all of the areas that you're going to have your modules on over the next three years so that you really become an expert. And you can actually write an article that quite quickly <coughs> with little extra work. You just have to plan it out, the sections, and then the words will flow because you have all of that knowledge in your head. Now, you're not going to be there just yet. So you need to do some of the things here about building a structure carefully. So you've got all that knowledge from the red butterfly track. And you're now thinking about planning the gold straight line from question to answer and conclusion. Now, there's lots of different ways of building that structure. So have many of you used mind maps at all? Hands up. Wow. Do they work for you? No. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, we're all different. For some people, mind maps work a treat. I, mean, I know of one guy who even produces his software specifications for other people to write using mind maps at the detailed specification level. That kind of pushes my brain a little bit. I'm not quite sure how you do that, but he works successfully like that. Sometimes people get, what get on well with it in terms of paper, some like to use some uh, electronic mechanisms like mind map. Alternatively, you can use PowerPoint and use the levels of indentation. The first level indentation is type, title of a section or a chapter, and then indent the next level for subsections and so on, or do it in Word. Whatever works for you. And as we're all different, what works for me may or may not work for you. It's good for me may not be good for you. So, choose, find out, experiment if you haven't already worked out what's best for you, and come up with the best tool that will help you to produce a structure that really works, that helps you then to create your article in Word very, very quickly. So there's lots of different ways of doing it, but you really need to do it. Otherwise, two things happen. You have a blank piece of paper or a blank script, um, Word document and writer's block happens. And you sort of sit staring at this <coughs> blank screen wondering what to do. If you've got on your screen all of the ch chapter headings or section headings and subsection headings <coughs> and sub-subsection headings using headers one, two, and three, it becomes so much easier because Typically, you'll have one or two paragraphs to write for every section three, level three. Ever so easy. And the words just flow. And the problem then comes how to stay within the constraint of those three pages or the word count that you've been doing. But get that structure right. And that's one of the things I'm going to be working with you in the workshops over the next couple of weeks, is watching you and helping you develop that structure to make it easy to write that compelling article that you're going to write. <coughs> so you start off with ultimately a blank document with the title pages from the um, 
the template. New page. How, how many of you know how to force Word to create a new page? Control enter. Insert page break. Please do not ever be tempted to use enter, 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 enter until the introduction falls off the bottom of a page to the top of a new page. Because when you go from one PC to another PC which has a different printer attached to it with different print or page sizes, it'll go nuts. And you may get your introduction three lines up on the first page or four lines down on the next page. It goes very flexible. And you won't be able to <coughs> constrain yourself to those three pages. So if you want to find the three pages, control enter, and then a few lines, and then control enter, and then work within that until you've got your three pages from the beginning of the introduction <coughs> to the end of your conclusion. You set out like that. And ideally, you're going to pop the, copy the assessment grid from the assignment spec to the back of your assignment, starting again at a new page. Now, as you write your article, you research it, you structure it, you write it, the whole point is of that, that grid is not just for, for me to be able to mark it, but it's for you to understand how to assess the quality of your own work. By the end of week <coughs> eight, when you submit this, you should know within about 10 mark, 10 points, what your score is going to be. It should not be a surprise if you get 45% or if you get 95%. It should not be a surprise to you. You might be a little bit surprised as to whether it's 45 or 48 or 50 or 95 or 86 or 87. That's sort of within you know, learning how to assess your own work. An area that <coughs> you really need to concentrate on is the left-hand column, <coughs> that column about presentation, about using the formatting correctly, using the formatting buttons when you get round to that last minute when you put the whole article back into the uh, template, the LNCS <coughs> template, and then start formatting it. You should, <coughs> without any difficulty, every single one of you be able to score 100% in that column. So use that column to think about, have I got my syntax and grammar right? What's a spell checker? Have a look at the wavy blue lines, the wavy red lines, the wavy green lines, whatever, that Word puts under, under phrases and so on. Understand what it's doing, check the spelling. And then when there are words like there and there, which are spelled two different ways, Make sure you got the right meaning, the right version of there at that point. Is it ownership or is it place? And try and get it right. <coughs> Have I got the <coughs> use the right buttons for the title, the subtitle, the author, the email address, the address, um, the keyword section, the abstract section? Have I used the right buttons to format all of that? Have I used the normal text button? to format all the paragraphs in each section so that I get the right indentation <coughs> on each paragraph. No indentation for the first paragraph and a small ind indentation for all of the rest of the paragraphs in that section. Have I got my citations done correctly? If you can't remember or you're not sure, go and look at Plato. And remind yourself by looking at that Word document you submitted into Turnitin last week, for most of you, did I get it right when I was doing it in the test in Plato? Use that to build your confidence. Go back to Plato, recheck. Go to Cite and Write to check how to cite each type of right source and have I got the references right? Use all of those clues to make sure that when you submitted your article, every aspect of presentation is correct. And then you've got 20 points already for your article before we even look at context and content. And then as you write those other two, or write the article, think about the context criteria 
and content criteria. And use those to drive your level of research, your right analysis and your writing to that really, really high level. So that's why I put that there, so that as you work through it, you can actually self-assess. How many points am I getting out of 100 for presentation? Have I forgotten the formats, the citations right, or the references? Have I got enough citations and references? And all the way through, and they will help you assess your work and then improve the quality. And so it's useful practice. It is not mandatory, but it is a useful idea in the top but one row of the grid to put in your marks out of 100 for each of those three columns to help you to assess yourself. And then we, you can think about when you get your marks, how did I over or under estimate the quality of my work. Because that's going to help you to learn how to keep the quality improving and improving over the next three years. So building that mind map of structures or word document with headers one, two, and three, or whatever, I don't care. But what are you going to be doing as you plot your way along the golden line? <coughs> well, what you're thinking about is, first of all, what are the major sections that take me along from the introduction through the main sections to that conclusion. What are the critical bits of analysis I'm doing? Those are the major section headings. And then you start thinking about the insides of each of those major sections. What are the topic areas that you need to write about? And you choose some words that make that section heading. And that begins to build up a structure now, every time you stop work, save it, and when you come back the next day or the day after, before you add anything to that document, review what you've already written in terms of the structure. And you may discover that you need to move ideas around, maybe from one section, major section to another major section, or you may want to switch the sequence. And at this stage, it's ever so easy because you just move, dragging and dropping, basically, a whole line from here to there. If you start having to do that once you've got lots of text written, it kind of gets a little bit more difficult to be sure you've carried the whole section plus its words and paragraphs to your new place. And you may lose a few words here or there. It's ever so easy with drag and drop type of editing or control X, <laughs> cut, and then paste. You may leave bits lying around. So have, editing your outline, reviewing the outline every time you come back to it, helps you to get a more and more <laughs> compelling sequence of ideas. You can also sometimes get ideas <coughs> from the assignment spec. You will all be getting ideas in the discussions in the workshop with me that will help you think about the structure, about the sequence, about the analysis you're trying to do. And all of that will help you build a more and more powerful structure. And then your research. All of that moving around that butterfly flight, that red line. Lots and lots of ideas will come from that. <coughs> and also, you know, if you are taking any of those feeds from um, professional websites like Tech Republic and many uh, ZDNet and CDNet and all these other um, blogs and repositories of interesting articles that are keeping the world of uh, IT and computer science awake at night, these will sometimes give you some interesting ideas that can bring your research right up to date, bring your article up to date the day before you publish it and submit it. What academics really want to happen. The latest, latest, latest information that adds extra life, extra validity, extra relevance to what you're writing about. <coughs> so let's go through the sections one by one. The things that you're trying to do in that introduction, those 10 lines that they suggest, no more than 10 lines, is capture. 
your reader's attention. Grab it. Make it so interesting, so unusual, something that the reader has never come across before, wants to learn more about. As you do your research, you'll come up with lots of different perspectives. That's already been written about. Your challenge with this article and many of your assignments is then to find a way that shows that you can construct a new way of looking at the topic, this different perspective. Because what we're doing in academia, among many other things, is finding ways of generating new knowledge. New ways for people to look at the way the world works. At the very pinnacle, you see the Nobel Prizes. We had one just announced today for the uh, 2016 Nobel Prize for Medicine. Something that people had never thought of beforehand. And now it's out there guiding further research, further developments in terms of medicine, in terms of drugs, and, and, and. And if you look across all of the Nobel Prizes, even if they are for work done 10, 15, 20 years ago, at the time they were doing it, they were coming up with interesting, unusual, and different perspectives. All of which, however, have to be supported with evidence from book research, the sort of stuff you are doing, and in most of the Nobel Prizes, actual real life research in terms of measuring things, building models, verifying them, validating those models. But coming up with something new. And the thing is, this is not something that applies only to dyed-in-the-wool senior academics, research academics. It's all the way through life. Even you guys, first year into your undergraduate degree, you can actually do this work. Don't sit back and think, oh, I'm first year, first semester, undergrad, I've just finished school or college. I can't possibly be expected to come up with something new. Why not? We each have a different history, a different set of experiences from each other, and those differences allow us to think differently from anybody else in the world. They make us unique. You are unique. You will all find different sets of sources, and you can come up with something that's interesting, unusual, and a different perspective. And most of you, I can assure you, from past running this module now for three years, most of you will come up with something interesting, unusual, and different from anything anybody has ever done before. Now that, because of what I'm so certain of, because I, I know what happens, what you can capable of, you will become unusual in British and Western universities. There are not many courses where you are pushed at this level successfully in your first semester of your university career. But you can do it, and you will mostly do it, unless you're feeling lazy. That's about the only reason why any of you won't come up with something unusual, interesting, and different the opportunity here to become unusual and outstanding. That helps you, of course, in your job interviews for your second, third year placement. Makes you stand out. And that's what job interviewers are looking for. Things that differentiate you guys from all the other students from all the other universities who are applying for those jobs. And there may be 30, 40, 50, 60 students applying for one job. You have to find something special. And here's your first opportunity. It'll be something that you can probably talk about at your interview. When you're there, 
then thinking about the main part of the article, the unconstrained part, other than it all fits within that three pages, is what is your message that is so unusual, special, different perspective? What is that message? Because you are telling a story in your own words, supported by those citations, the evidence that turns it from a fairy tale into a piece of academic research writing. So you're going to find a structure that picks up or works on a logical structure that demonstrates in a nice, clear sequence your analysis of the various sources that you're using to bring out the, the topic. You have to think about how do you or how do I show the evidence. One of the most important messages, folks, is do not rely on copying a chunk of text out of one source, popping it in there, copy paste, um, and then put a citation. Because all of your academic assignments are effectively a window into your brain, into your mind, about how you think. So the fact that you can copy paste cite is of absolutely no interest to me at all. I want to know what your brain is doing with that evidence. So even if you felt you wanted to copy paste the, uh, that little phrase or that paragraph, you need to then demonstrate what you are thinking about that. Why is it relevant in the context? How are you going to use it as part of your argument, your analysis? And those are the words that I want to read, because they tell me how your brain's working, how you're applying your ideas from here and there and there to this context to come up with this idea, this conclusion. So do not think that you can get away with lots of copy-paste sight. I have no window on your mind. Wanting to understand, and we're all wanting to understand, the contribution that you are actually developing and making in your <coughs> assignment, in your article. So, tell the story in your own words, in a logical structure, your own analysis, citing the evidence with citations, and that will help you to create something that really is special to you. If you keep doing so and so says, or citation confirms that, you're then moving away from your own natural <coughs> sequence of thinking and analysis to being constrained by this source says, this source says, this source says, and then try and bolt it together. If you do the he says, she says citing, I self 2012 suggests that, blah, 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 in your own words, you are quite likely then to use my words in your explanation of what I say. And, that, and you're then likely not to put the right quotes around it to say it show it's a, 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 a quotation, because you forgot that it's actually my words, but you kind of remembered them. And that becomes a problem, doesn't it? If you've done your Plato, you'll know that that's not a good idea. So what is your message? in your own words with lots of citations. And then the final section, that last little section before you end your three pages of content, what's the conclusion? Remind the reader what the critical points of your analysis were and where it has got them, or where you have led us to. So, it's a very, very simple summary of the most important points that your analysis has come up with. And you're thinking about the conclusion in those, those terms become more and more important the longer your piece of writing is. And when you get to your final year and do your dissertation project, which you all will do, 
your literature review will be something around three to five thousand words. You know, about four or five times longer than the article that you're writing at the moment. And human memories aren't good enough, really, to remember the critical points of a piece of, of text, three to five thousand words long. So you need to have a little conclusion at the end of what's called the literature review to remind your reader what those key points were that will then lead into the next chapter. So the conclusion is very, very important. But it summarizes everything. The reminder about your bibliography or references section. We tend to be a little bit uh, loose with our terms, bibliography and references section, but mostly we mean what it says up here. <coughs> Properly formatted to the conventions that you're given. So this one is Harvard. Some of you uh, may, in a year or so's time, or maybe even next semester, may be introduced to a different numeric referencing standard, because that's the standard for that particular subject area. Whichever you're using, learn to format correctly. Unless otherwise stated, the list of references at the end of your assignments will be only those sources <coughs> that you have actually cited. You aren't writing a chapter in a textbook where sometimes you'll find a list of other interesting sources or other interesting readers. That is not what you are doing. You're producing a list of those sources you have cited. And typically, if you've done a good piece of work, of research, to build your working bibliography, probably you will end up using maybe half of them. If that leaves you with only four or five or six sources in your bibliography, and you actually research 10, 15, 20, 30, you need to think about why haven't I used those other sources as in such the form of citations? What have I left out in my writing as part of your uh, review, review process? So only those sources that you have written and dependent on the um, referencing standard, mostly you need to sort your list of references into alphabetical order of the surname of the lead author. Sometimes, as you already know from working through Plato, it could be, if there's no clear named person as an author, it could be just an organizational name. That counts as the lead author for that purpose. So sort them. You will lose 10% of your referencing element in the presentation if you do not sort your references correctly. They must be sorted. A few other things. What instructions are you given about formatting? Length, number of words, number of pages, whatever. They will all vary different papers and conferences I submit things to, all have different formatting and everything else is different. So you have to read the instructions carefully and then just follow them. <coughs> In business they, there's a little uh, term JDI. Just do it. Deal with it guys. The rules are the rules. If you want to succeed you have to follow the rules. It's and it's pervasive across businesses, industries, and everything else. Just follow. <laughs> Don't have a debate. It isn't going to get you anywhere. It will just get the people involved who set the task irritated. And if you start irritating people, your grades are likely to go down. If you're in business, you probably lose your job. That's not a good or helpful thing. Just date JDI. One other aspect which wasn't on there is to do with what's required at the very first page is the abstract. 
The abstract is not yet another introduction. The type of abstract you want to write is a kind of little sales pitch. So it covers a little bit of the context, a little bit of the analysis, and the critical message that you come up with in your conclusion. The abstract is what is there to persuade the browser of a, a list of a set of articles to go, ah, this is the article I really want to read because of something. Something that you have put in there that grabs my attention about its unusualness, the fact it's interesting, the fact it's a different perspective. So that's what the abstract is all about, grabbing the attention before I even start thinking about reading your introduction. So the abstract, abstract is a marketing sales sort of thing to capture your reader. If you go and look at, in the library, some of the old journals which are paper-based, you will often see in the table of contents part of the, part of the abstract is there. And you'll see mostly the abstract are the marketing type rather than the one that says, in this article, I or we evaluate blah, we do this blah, and we carry out this analysis blah. And you think, yeah, but that's what the instruction <coughs> to the assignment said. So in principle, if you do a process type abstract, I'll get 170 different uh, abstracts which all the say, say the same thing that's in the assignment spec. Do the marketing abstract that sells your little, your article to me as being brilliant. And then, yep, you have the introduction context section of three, uh, ten lines, which justify why the, art, the topic area is interesting. Then your analysis, then your conclusions. And I know, ah, now I've learned something really interesting. And I already know that from the emails that I've had from one or two of you and one or two of your discussions, that there are some really interesting ideas already being developed. Here we are, end of week two, just beginning week three. You will all do that, because you can. Thank you very much, folks. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>